thank you for that warm introduction. I used to didn't like teenagers, like the rest of you. When persons uh, talked about the youth group, I kind of shuddered and would hide away. One father said to me recently, my daughter's 13. I wished I could just go to sleep and wake up when she's 20. I think our difficulty with teenagers is partly because we have not resolved our own adolescent conflicts sometimes, and we're still uneasy about some of the things that we did. I know for certain that one reason I don't trust the guys who date my daughter is I remember when I was a teenager, and I remember what those other guys were saying and doing. Of course, I was never in that group myself. <laughs> I'm going to be talking about teenagers in crisis and not so much the family crisis of having a teenager. I think having a teenager can be as much of a blessing as it is a crisis, depending on our stance toward them. But teenagers do get in difficulty, and in increasing numbers. I spent one of my sabbatical study leaves traveling around to uh, 14 or 15 different cities, interviewing teenagers, and talking to them about their concerns. I sent out 300 questionnaires to youth ministers and pastors and asked them to tell me the kind of problems that they had in working with teenagers, what, what was happening with the contemporary youth scene, what kind of programs and approaches and principles were working with them. And as I pulled all of that together, I got a picture of teenagers that was radically different even than, than when I was a youth minister 20-some years ago. Adolescence has always been a tumultuous, tough transition between childhood and adulthood. You might want to think of the transition of a caterpillar into a butterfly. The caterpillar, however, goes into a chrysalis stage and weaves the cocoon and is covered during that transition. Unfortunately, teenagers make that transition right out in the open. They enter into adolescence on a skateboard, and they exit in the family car if they're fortunate. And a lot happens in between. And it happens right out there in public. I'd like for us to not think of adolescents tonight as all one group. But I'd like for us to think of them as persons in transition between childhood and adulthood. Now, there is some difference between a 33-year-old and a 39-year-old adult, but not all that much. But look at the difference between a 13-year-old and a 19-year-old young adult. What a transition. It happens so fast, and it happens so individually, and it happens so publicly. No wonder they're in crises over and over and again. Pre-adolescence is that period of transition when socially and maybe educationally and even family-wise, a child is moving into some rebellion, but they haven't hit puberty yet. 10, 11, 12, 13-year-olds might be pre-adolescent. They're adolescent in their behavior, just not quite physiologically. Most researchers would put the beginning of adolescence at the beginning of puberty, when the changes begin to happen. When, when the girls start talking to their mother about buying new articles of clothing and the boys wear the mirror out looking for arm hairs, you know, and they're just I always, when will I, when will I, when will I? Early adolescence is a time of adjusting to one's new body. Surely you can remember what it was like to wake up one morning and suddenly to feel that you had been blasted by a zit machine and all over your face were these marks you had never seen before? Surely you remember what it was like to feel that only your ears were growing or your nose was growing or some other part of your anatomy was not growing as you would want it to. All oh, the early adolescent turmoil. And they don't know who to talk with. They don't know where to turn. And they feel so embarrassed. And many of the 
crazy things that they do are merely attempts to hide the shame and embarrassment, to find answers to the questions of what am I going to do with my new body and how am I going to adjust to it. Middle adolescents, on the other hand, those 15, 16, maybe 17-year-olds, have pretty much gone through the major changes physiologically, and they are emotionally and mentally and socially finding out what they can do with that new body. They will try almost anything one time. They're likely to get in difficulty answering questions that they're afraid to ask their parents, and so they're going to look for their own answers. Or they get in difficulty experimenting with their new found freedom. Hopefully, older adolescents... 18, 19-year-olds, 20, 21, 25, 30, you know, older adolescents are in the process of refinement. They're in the process of settling the identity crisis and saying, I'm going to be this kind of person. They have two big decisions to make in life. One has to do with how they're going to deal with their needs for intimacy. Are they going to get married? And if so, what kind of person? And the second has to do how are they going to need meet their needs for vocation and economics. How are they going to get involved in a job or in training? What are they going to do? And those are major decisions for them. Can you imagine in just that short period of seven years between 13 and 19, moving from being worried about a pimple to having to make a decision about a life partner? From being concerned about maybe my, my ears are growing too much? to being concerned with how you're going to support yourself the rest of your life. We forget so easily, don't we? And these concerns aren't so important to the adults in their life sometimes. Well, as I talked to teenagers and as I accumulated the data from teachers and youth ministers and pastors, I became aware that growing up is itself a crisis. A crisis is a turning point that brings both danger and opportunity. And the turning point of adolescence is a crisis. And perhaps the developmental concerns need to be our first concerns. In caring for an adolescent in crisis, I would suggest that you first ask yourself, where is this adolescent developmentally, before you begin to ask the crisis questions. For example, how are they grieving the loss of their friend or how are they dealing with the divorce of their parents? Find out what's going on with them developmentally. I think the developmental template needs to be the first one that we put on any teenager that we're, that we're with. And they'll tell us if we'll just listen a while. Ask them what, what's life for, uh, like for them. But the developmental concerns that came back from the survey and from the teenagers primarily focused around self-acceptance and self-identity. Teenagers are really worried about what other people think about them. That's why they wear the clothes that they wear, so they can, they can have people think this way about them. That, that's why they act the way they do around their parents and grandparents sometimes. That's why they make the decisions that they make. They are concerned in finding out what the environment says about who they are. What's my identity? What will I stand for? And that's a major concern for them. And you can minister to them by simply giving them some positive feedback and being a mirror. And giving them some limits and some confrontation and being a mirror. Can, maybe saying to them, I don't find that cute, or I find that particularly desirable about you. I like the fact that, that you ask these questions. I don't like the fact that you throw those temper tantrums or, or whatever it is. Self-identity was a key concern for them. Another key concern for teenagers is finding appropriate friends. Adolescence is the time of moving away from parental dependence and into the world, and peers are the bridge into that. We tend as adults not to take our teenagers' friendships seriously enough. We don't take their dating relationships seriously enough. Did you know the number one precipitating factor in adolescent male suicide attempts is the loss of a girlfriend? 
The number one precipitating factor in adolescent suicide is the loss of a girlfriend. And most of us are thinking, oh, it's just puppy love. You know, it's really not important. Friends are very, very important. The loss of a friend is very important. When I was writing the Ann Landers type column, I would get numerous letters from teenagers around the United States. A good 80% of them had to do with the topic of girlfriend, boyfriend, or best friend has betrayed me. Friendships are very, very important to teenagers. And we can do a lot in our church. We can do a lot in our homes to meet some of those needs for them. The third most frequently mentioned developmental conflict for teenagers are parents and conflicts with parents. One teenager was talking with me, and I asked if she would repeat this on videotape for our uh, program that we were doing with parents, and she put it this way. Everybody says, if you have a problem, go to your parents. You have a problem, go to your parents. What do you do when your parents are the problem? I lead a number of youth retreats, do a number of uh, conferences for uh, high school and college age students. And one of the most popular is what makes parents act like we do? What makes parents act like we do? And one of the second most popular is how to fight with your parents and win. <laughs> they love it. What makes us parents act like we do? What makes adults act like we do? Well, I've already told you one. We remember when we were adolescents and we're trying to keep them from having some of the same problems. Two, we watch too much TV. I thought they watched too much TV. No, we do. Because we let the media give us a distorted image of adolescence. See, we think they're all the way those troubled teenagers are. They're really not. About 60 to 70 percent of today's teenagers are beautiful, wonderful young people who are going to be the kind of adults that you are, and, and that's good news. But we act as if they're all that way, and we get worried. So our teenagers 30 minutes late, and we start jumping to conclusions about major problems. The teenagers in our church do just a little deviant something or the other, and we jump to conclusions. You know, they're all drug addicts, they're alcoholics, they're in We We watch too much TV. Another thing that makes parents act like we do is that sometimes we try to live our lives out through our children. And that's not fair to them, especially teenagers. I'm talking to a woman now from Minnesota. They've been transferred into Louisville. And she says, I didn't date much as a teenager. I, I regret that I didn't have a lot of fun as a teenager. And now my daughter and I are just in constant conflict because all she wants to do on weekends is stay home and do her homework and hang around the house. And I can't get her out dating. I can't. Get, and she says she's not interested in dating. And she's 15 years old, and I'm afraid she's going to be an old maid. <laughs> Goodness. Why, why can't the mother see? Now, another reason teenagers act like they do, a very plain reason, is they imitate us. They imitate us. I, I remember a family counseling session. The family came in for the third session. They were there because their 15-year-old son had been caught with a couple of joints of marijuana at school, and he was in serious trouble. And the parents uh, were there, and I try always to see adolescents in a family context. And... Uh, we'd, we'd been making some headway, talking about conflict a little bit, and uh, the parents were very well-to-do and just couldn't believe their son had embarrassed them like this, very active in the Methodist church. And the six-year-old daughter, the uh, nine-year-old, the teenager, and dad and mom were sitting in the office, and I began to ask them, what do we need to talk about today? And dad folds his arm and says, I don't think anything. Mom didn't say a word. The teenage boy is just sitting there. And so in silence, I waited with him for a moment. And the blessed little six-year-old said, Daddy, why don't you tell him how you threw the glass of tea on brother when he called you a hypocrite? <laughs> I said, well, yes, why don't you tell me about that? I mean, what a therapeutic breakthrough. How can, I mean, prayers are answered when these people are trying to... And I said, well, what happened? Well, I just lost my temper, the father said. And the mother said, well, here, look at this. And she pulled out this crumpled piece of paper. 
And there was a crude picture of Father standing with his finger pointing at the sun, a cigar hanging out his mouth, a martini glass in his hand, and saying, Don't you know what you did was wrong? And across it in red letters he had written with a marking pen, Hypocrite. Where did he learn to abuse substance? From his father. I mean, when a man's uptight, he turns to something to make him feel better, doesn't he? The boy had learned quickly. The boy had learned quickly. They imitate us. If you want to change the adolescence in your home, change yourself first. If you really want to revolutionize your grandchildren, and even your nieces and nephews, every now and then ask them for their objective opinion and say, do you know, my kids probably and my spouse doesn't always tell but if you could change one thing about Grandpa, what would you change? If you could change one thing about Grandma, what would you change? And they'll tell you. They'll tell you. If you dare, ask your kids that sometimes. Ask them that. It can be difficult. But they'll tell you. And then they'll also answer the question, if you could change one thing about yourself, what would you change? And they'll talk with you about that too. If you give them first shot at you. So they, they act like us. That's part of why they act like they, uh, we act like we do. The developmental concerns had a lot of parental content in it. Most parents make one of two mistakes. We either let go too soon or we hold on too tight. Finding the exact balance for each teenager is difficult. You can't turn them all loose at the same level of decision making because of difference in social maturity, difference in intellectual ability, difference in spiritual maturity, difference in environment. There are so many things that are different. There's no particular time to let a teenager have the first date, make their big decisions. We have to Push and back off and push and back off with, with each one of them. Vocational decisions was another developmental crisis, particularly among the older ones. But one 15-year-old boy said, My parents keep asking me to get a job, but no one wants to hire a 15-year-old. And that's true. Vocational decisions can start early on. And they're really not sure about jobs and how to work. They need a lot of education about that. And I've put in the developmental category the fifth problem that they mentioned, and that was religious questions. One teenager said, I feel like I can't ask my pastor the questions I have about God because he will think I'm losing my faith. If you can't turn to your pastor, where can you turn? We need to create an open environment for them where they can talk about religious questions. I mentioned earlier that I said it was good news when a 13-year-old told his mother he thought he was becoming an atheist. And I told the mother it's good news because he'll talk to you about it because he's thinking about God. They need a place to talk about religious questions. They need a time to talk about religious questions. They need to be able to ask the questions that we don't have a quick answer for and that we're willing to research. I really think that most of us in our Christian education approach with adolescents shoot too low. You probably ought to be offering middle and late adolescents the kind of courses you would take in your first semester at seminary about the Bible. Do you know why I say that? Because that's when they're taking first semester in college courses in chemistry and math and other subjects and literature. They are thinking at that level in other fields of their life, and they're thinking in that level about religion if given the opportunity to do so. We, for the most part, under-demand under -demand a response for the adolescents in our churches. Mansell Patterson did some research on why teenagers joined cults. Why they were willing to go and stand in some airport all day long and beg money for some religious leader. Why they would give up all that they have. I mean, they want their freedom from their parents and they go and slave themselves. And do you know why these teenagers went? Because there were clear demands and because they were willing to talk with them about difficult subjects. 
while at most of our churches, the most demanding thing that we do is we ask them, please don't throw your trash on the ground after the wiener roast. We're missing the boat when we don't demand more intellectual integrity in our adolescent religious education. We need to push them. We need to push them. Now, other crises came from rebellion and acting out and from broken relationships. And they centered around the big issues. When I ask teenagers, what's the number one pressure that you face in the world every day? And I eliminated these developmental issues. We've just, what's the real pressure or problem area that you deal with? Can you guess what they said repeatedly? Anybody? Peer pressure. That one comes up often. That was on their list. That wasn't it. Addictions comes up often. They said the number one problem just like that was sex. Lack of sex education, not, not knowing what's going on. Sexual pressure, the men feeling that they were pressured. If I'm not trying to hit on a woman, she thinks I'm gay. If I'm trying to hit on a woman, she thinks something else is wrong with me. The women saying I'm sick and tired of being treated like a, 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 a sexual object. We don't know how to be friends without being sexual. There are teenagers that are out there involved in sexual acts with each other who can't even talk to each other. Who don't even, they can't even say the words with you. They're embarrassed, but they're doing it. And that's the society we've created because the media says, if you're normal, that's what you're doing. If you're normal, that's where you are. And that is a pressure for them. Number one problem, they said, without, I mean, they, there was just never any question, were the sexual pressures that they feel. The sexual pressures. That they, the second problem was addiction, alcohol, and drugs. An alarming number of Western adolescents are turning to experimentation with alcohol and drugs very, very early in their life. The third biggest problem that they face is loneliness and depression. Loneliness and depression. Not having friends and, and not having someone there. Now, you mentioned peer pressure. As I talked about these problems, I would probably say all of these are peer pressure issues. But when I talk to teenagers about peer pressure, they say, there's no peer pressure. I don't feel any peer pressure. When I was on the adolescent unit at the psychiatric hospital, we were talking with them about their involvements in addictions, and several of them were there because they were addicted. And I said to one young lady, Susan, how did you get hooked on hard drugs so early? Was it peer pressure? She said, no. I, I started smoking marijuana when I was 13. And I was just with some friends, and they were doing the hard stuff. And I said, hey, give me some. There was no peer pressure. Isn't that strange? When we say to teenagers peer pressure, they think of somebody running around them, try it, try it, try it with your finger. That's not the kind of peer pressure they experience. It's the subtle peer pressure. The same reason that we buy the clothes we buy and drive the cars we drive and say some of the things we say and maybe even preach some of the sermons we preach because we think we're supposed to if we're going to be okay people. That's the peer pressure they're under, and I think it affects them in sexual problems, in their loneliness, in alcohol and drugs. In the mid-'80s, I began to hear some teenagers talk about a problem that most of them talk about now. Teenagers today fear for their physical safety. They fear for their physical safety, probably more so than you all do as a group. They don't want to be shot. They don't want to be knived. They don't want to be abused. They fear for their safety. And hardly can you turn on the television without seeing a story that someone has kidnapped a 13-year-old girl, a 15-year-old girl, and murdered over and over. And they hear that. I don't know if you have the difficulty here, but a number of our high schools uh, in Louisville, which was a very safe city for a long time, have metal detectors at the door. A, no a number of our schools have outlawed certain kind of clothing. For a semester, they couldn't even bring their book packs into the classroom at um, one of my daughter's schools, seventh grade, because they were bringing knives and guns in, in the book packs. They fear for their safety. Most of us don't live with that thought, do we? But they do. It's hard to study when you're wondering if the person next to you is going to pull out 
a gun and begin shooting. And then the next problem was the problem with driving and accidents and death, all the responsibility of that. I suggested to the group in the discussion today that we think about having a blessing or some type of ritual at church every time somebody gets their driver's license. And we celebrate with them and we pray for the responsibility that it is. They're taking lives in their hands in a way they never did before. Well, the escalation of teenage violence, of suicide, addiction, and major sexual problems serves as a testimony to all of us that our society is not prepared to nurture healthy families in this fast-moving space age. And I look around and I say, who's going to do it? Perhaps the schools will help some. Some medical groups are accepting some responsibility for education. But I really think the number one place is in the church. We need to be providing information about how to respond to adolescents in crisis. We probably do more youth ministry than most any other organization in society other than the public schools, which have to do the education. We have access to them. We can invite them. They will come, and we can begin to make a difference. And I would suggest that youth ministry be focused also in parent ministry and in guardian ministry, that we begin to educate them about how to respond to adolescents in crisis. Technology is moving so fast. We're in a space-age world of Internet communication, computerized virtual reality, discoveries of new black holes, and even a couple of months ago discovered that there are five times as many galaxies as we knew. Did you see that they just focused the Hubble spacecraft on a galaxy 13 billion light years away? 13 billion light years away? Technology is light years ahead of family ministry and family understanding. We know more about what attracts certain species of insects to each other than we do about how adolescents date. And that's a crime. We simply aren't investing ourselves in the right questions. Well, I would like to suggest some principles of caring for teenagers and their families. I would turn the spotlight on your relationship to them, your ability to figure out what's going on with them, that is your assessment, and then your willingness to get involved in their lives, your willingness to be a part of the solution and the answer for them. As a caring professional, we need to take teenagers seriously. And first of all, that means we need to learn to respect them. My guess is if you're with a very large group of teenagers at school or in your community or in your church someplace, you can see the pecking order. You can see that one girl that's pushed aside, that one boy that's picked on. You know, the one the rest of them calls a nerd or a geek behind their backs. You know which one they are, don't you? Make that one your best friend. One of the first things you can do is learn to respect every teenager and teach them to do the same thing. Learn to respect them. By the way, you know what the uh, C students call the A students in high school and college? Geeks, nerds, brains, four eyes, all the things. You know what they call them after graduation? Boss. <laughs> teach teenagers to respect each other for their uniquenesses. Teach the in-group to respect those who make good grades and not throw down on them. Teach those who make good grades to respect those who may struggle, who may give their best effort and still only make a C or a D. Teach them to respect each other because you respect the entire group. Get them out of the habit of calling names. Get them into the habit of caring for each other. The first place as a professional that you world is becoming someone who respects teenagers, who likes teenagers, and they know that about you. Then, if you're going to work with teenagers, I would suggest that you really work on being faithful to them. When you tell them you're going to be there, be there. 
If you say, I'll come by and visit you, go by and visit them. Be there for them. Teenagers can spot a phony a mile away. Faithfulness in the durability of our relationships is paramount with adolescence. So is flexibility. You've got to roll with the punches when you're working with teenagers. I remember counseling a young man who had had three attempts at suicide, struggling with his family, parents had divorced, father was a busy, successful attorney and didn't have time for him. Our relationship was really difficult. And one day he came into my office and he said, Man, he said, you, you just care about me because my mom pays a fee and because you're supposed to be a counselor. I said, what makes you say that? I said, I really do care about you. He said, okay. He said, let's go to this office and let's go down to the Pizza Inn. And he said, let's sit down there with my friends and talk. Will you do that for the hour? And I said, sure. Let's go. He said, are you serious? I said, yes. We'll take my car. And for the next seven formal sessions that we had, I did call his parents and tell them what we were doing. I met him at the Pizza Inn. And we sat down there and talked. After a while, he said to me, you know, this is pretty dumb. I said, what do you mean? He said, we're talking about some pretty intimate things, and we're right out here in public. We ought to be in the quietness of your office. <laughs> yeah? Okay. So you've got to be flexible. You've got to roll with the punches. Sometimes they'll want to meet you there. Sometimes they'll want to. And you never know where they are. Sometimes they'll want to talk seriously. They come to my office, and they pour out their hearts. Other times they want to come to my office and they're not ready to deal with anything. They want to tell jokes. They want to laugh. They, they, want, to, they want a friend for a while. I think the best image that you could think is that you are a caring, trained, professional friend to teenagers in crisis. And sometimes you represent the care and sometimes you represent the faith witness and sometimes you represent your professional training and sometimes you're just one human friend reaching out to another human friend. Teenagers need empathy. They need you to really remember what it was like when you were their age. Don't make fun of a teenage boy trying to get enough nerve to ask a girl for a date. Don't you remember what that was like, guys? Boy, I mean, those were life and death matters. Don't you remember hiding someplace and getting a phone? And, of course, ladies, you remember what it was like sitting by the phone waiting for it to ring? You remember what it was like when you thought you were going to have a date and he didn't show up? You remember what it was like when you wanted to ask him out so much? And so he comes and starts talking to you, and you think, wow, well, it's going to work. And then he says, would you set me up with your girlfriend? <laughs> oh, you can empathize, can't you? You can empathize. You remember what it was like when you got the exams back and your marks weren't as high as they wanted to be? When you hadn't studied for the test, when you'd forgotten something? When you were standing there in front of your peers, embarrassed to tears? I'm going to just die. The world's going to come to an end. My daughter said when she couldn't get her hair fixed one morning for school? <laughs> but can't you empathize with that? Sure. They need our empathy. They need us to understand their pain. And they need our self-control. I don't know how to say this politely, but if you're a shepherd of the sheep, don't butcher them. I have no patience for adult caregivers who sexually and physically abuse teenagers. Pick on someone your own size. Don't abuse them. I can't count on my hands the number of people who have come to me to say, I was sexually molested by my youth minister, by my pastor, by my missions leader, by my school teacher, there ought to be stiffer laws against such. But it's hard to get a conviction in the States. I don't know about here. I don't know about here. We have no idea of the years of trauma that we caused when we prey upon those we're supposed to be praying for. It's a double it's a double betrayal when it's a representative of God that betrays them. 
Just no easy way to say it. We must be responsible. And if you think you are in trouble, if you start getting attracted to that lovely teenage girl, to that handsome teenage boy, for your sake, for their sake, for God's sake, run someplace to get help. If you're in trouble now, go get help from a professional and do it before it's too late. For semester after semester after semester, I gave an entire lecture on this to my class. Please, when you first get tempted, ask for help, because it can happen to any of us. And 11 o'clock one night, my phone rang. And a student who had been in enough of my classes that I recognized his voice said, Wade, I need help. I called him a name and said, what, what's wrong? He said, I've done something seriously wrong. Can you help protect me? I said, well, if it's illegal, I don't know. He said, it's illegal. I said, well, we're going to have to get a lawyer involved in something, but I'll, I'll hear you. What's happened? He said, I don't know. I don't know. He said, I, I, things have been going poorly at the church. He said, my wife and I have been having difficulties. He said, I don't know why I did it. He said, I paid money and picked up a young male prostitute in our community. He spent the money on a radio. His parents disciplined him, spanked him until he said where he got the money. They thought he'd stolen it. And I'm afraid I'm going to be arrested tonight. What can I do? Oh, my heart was breaking. How had we failed to reach this young seminarian? He got an attorney. He confessed to what had been going on. But he still did time. He got out and he refused to get help. His wife left him, and within a year he was back in prison for molesting another teenager. I can't believe we failed that young man, but we did. We must, in working with adolescents, take seriously their active sexuality and our temptations. And we must get help. We must not protect abusers. I don't care if they give 90% of our church budgets. We must, we must protect teenagers from adult crimes. And it's getting worse in our society. It's getting worse. The latest statistic I heard was one in four teenage girls in the United States will be sexually molested by an adult before she's 18 years of age. We must bring a halt. We must bring a halt to that. And then, another principle of caring for teenagers is we must maintain their confidentiality within limits. I tell them, I, I will, what you say here, I will, I'll not tell. I might encourage you to tell, unless it's illegal. And I say to them, if you're molesting little children in the church nursery, I'm going to turn you in. I remember having an argument with a 15-year-old girl that I was not breaking her confidentiality, that I was taking her more seriously than she was taking, when she walked into my room with her wrist bleeding. Her parents had brought her to the church to talk. They had no idea she had cut her wrist just five minutes before they left. And I saw her trying to hold them. I said, pull up your sleeves, Jenny. No, Jenny. Then I saw the drop of blood. I said, Jenny... We've got to tell your parents. You've got to get some help. You promised me confidentiality, I said. I said, yes, I'm not going to tell the secret. We are going to tell. You need help. Professional confidentiality is not secret keeping necessarily. It's dealing with the material professionally with them. And I say that to them up front. And so I say, there may be some things you don't want to tell me because I'm going to take you very seriously. But we don't go around telling their secrets to the other teenagers in the church, telling their parents, unless the parents really have to know what's going on and they need to know. I guess what I'm trying to say is the most important thing that you can give a teenager is a human connection, Christian to Christian. That's the first thing we have to give them. I'd like to suggest that as we try to figure out exactly what's going on in their lives, 
they haven't matured enough to come and tell us which kind of problem they're bringing. It would be nice if they came with warning labels that say, I'm depressed, I'm acting out sexually, I have an alcohol problem, I have a school problem, I'm having trouble with my parents. They are one big, buzzing, massive confusion when they walk into our offices many times. They need help. And we have to begin to make some sense out of it. And as I said, the first thing you want to know is ask yourself, what developmental stage, what are the normal things for this developmental stage? What are they saying is normal and what are they saying is abnormal? Then you need to get the facts. Tell me what's hurting. Tell me what's wrong. And then you have to sort through what's real and what's not real. What's their distortion and what's really in there? I remember one teenage boy, he was referred by the wife of our youth minister to me, said he called me three times this week threatening to take his own life. Fifteen-year-old in our church. She said, "I, I told him I want him to come and talk with you. Well, he had a crush on the wife of the youth minister, which was one of the problems. When I asked him what really bothered him most, he said, nobody likes me. I said, what do you mean? He said, I mean, I walk down the hall at school and I say, hi, Joe, hi, Bob, hi, William, hi, Barb, hi, Peg. I said, nobody speaks to me. I can't believe that, I said. He said, well, it's true. I said, I don't believe you. He said, it's true. I said, let's, let's ask. He said, what do you mean? I said, I want you to take a notebook, and all next week, I want you in between your classes, when you speak to somebody, if they speak to you, you, get your, you write it down, and you put yes or no beside their name. I want to really know that everybody isn't speaking to you. Because, you see, one of the problems with adolescence is their all or nothing thinking. Of course, that's sometimes a problem with adults, too. All or nothing thinking gets them in real trouble. So he came back the next week and he says, Oh, I'm cured. I said, what do you mean? He said, 42% of the people, he did okay in math, 42% of the people spoke to me. I was sad. Do you imagine how you would feel if nearly 6 out of 10 people you spoke to walked on by you? That really is lonely. But he got things in perspective. So when you're sorting out the facts with them, try to get the picture. I mean, don't call them a liar, but listen to what what they're saying behind what they're saying. Also, when you're trying to sort out the picture, you want to ask them the circumstance of the crisis. They will develop their story, and by the second or third telling, it may or may not be what happened that night. I remember a teenager who was in trouble with the law because he tried to protect himself, in his words. He was stopped for speeding. Police officer wanted to see his driver's license. He smarted off to the police officer. Police officer reached through the window and grabbed him. Teenager floored the car and dragged the police officer down the road. Now he said, all I was trying to do is protect myself. Well, when we got a few more facts of the story, it began to look a little different. He had only told his parents that he didn't know why the police were upset with him. He hadn't hurt anybody. Get the facts. Find out about their friends early on. What group are they running with? One of my favorite questions when I'm trying to figure out some sense out of the confusion with an adolescent that's sitting in the church or talking to me someplace is I'll say, who are your best friends? And what are their hobbies and what do they do? Imagine the pain you would have felt if your 16-year-old daughter had said to you what one of the girls in our church Sunday school class said to me. She said, my best friend right now is Charlie. I said, Charlie? I don't think I know Charlie. Yes, Tattoo Charlie, who owns the tattoo shop downtown. He's 23, and does he have a big motorcycle? That's the 16-year-old's best friend? Well, I'm sorry if some of you drive big motorcycles and run tattoo shops, but I don't want my daughter running around with you. I mean, there, there are some friends. Just tell me your friends, and you know. Now, my daughter gets on to my case about judging people too soon. She goes to a special high school that you apply to get in, and there are some spike hair, pink hair, purple hairdos down there. She said, Dad... 
Those kids aren't necessarily on drugs. They make as good a grades as I do. They just have some mixed up parents. <laughs> well, she may not be too wrong. But I still... You can tell something about the bird from the flock they fly with. So find out about their environment. I also find out early on about their faith resources. I say, are you a person that goes to church? Uh, what do you know about God? What do you believe about God? What do you not believe about God? I want to know early on. I, before I ask, I used to just begin to offer faith resources. I had one 16-year-old girl, again, at the mental hospital, curse me out. I, I said, you know, I found this scripture particularly helpful to me. And she said, blank, blank, blank you. Don't you use scripture on me. I'm a queen with a scepter in the Baptist Church GA program. I know more scripture than you'll ever know. And she was right. She was also in there because she'd been working as a prostitute. I said to her on a later visit, you know, you may know more scripture than I do. But knowing it and living, it's a different matter. And you're really having trouble living what you know, aren't you? She said, most of it wasn't true. I said, well, I disagree with you. Find out about their faith experience. Don't assume. Find out what they know. I mentioned this young boy in the workshop that I'm working with now. His 15-year-old brother committed suicide three weeks ago. He's 14, and he found the body. It's been very traumatic for him. He's in several difficult situations. I've been to court with him already. And he said two interesting things to me. One, the third time he came to my office, and my office is in the church deliberately, he looked around and he said, you know, I could break out of this church if you locked me up in here. I said, son, that's easy for most people to do. The difficult thing, the real question I want to know is, do you know how to break into this church? He said, you lock it at nights? I said, no, that's not what I mean. I said, would you know how to be a faithful follower in this church, even if you decided to be? He said, I don't think so. I don't think so. Talk with them about faith issues. Don't be embarrassed about it. After you figure out what's going on, probably there are going to be three or four things going on. Their problem with the parents, there may be some substance abuse, maybe some sexual acting out, and probably some school problems. They don't come in neat little packages. Figure out where you're going to focus one problem at a time. Begin to focus on one issue with them and get them to commit with you that they'll work on that issue with you. We need to be able to diagnose from many different angles. Walk around them and look at them developmentally and look at them family-wise and look at them faith-wise and look at them from their peer point of view. See what's going on in their life. Don't leave a multidimensional diagnosis up to the social worker or up to the therapist or up to the physician that's working with them. You need to be a part of that too. You need to know what's going on. And you can't do it all alone. Work with those other professionals. Be a part of a treatment team. You can't do it alone. Have some counselors where you can refer them, refer them. Know the juvenile court authorities in your community. Work with the teachers in your community. Then you begin to be a part of an intervention team of teenagers in crisis. You, a representative of the faith, you've made some appropriate referrals, but it's time for you to talk with them. It's time for you to help them find faith as a resource in their life, to find forgiveness for the real guilt they feel, to find the truth for the imagined things they think they've done, and to begin a faith journey with these adolescents. You're the one that helps them find meaning in the midst of the stories. And probably we need to do that in consultation with other ministers and with other professionals. I really think that ministers should not be permitted
to be in private practice. I don't think you should be able to pastor a church, pray with a young person, teach a Sunday school class without having to be responsible to other adults. Physicians can't. Attorneys really can't. Teachers have to be responsible to others. Why shouldn't ministers? We ought to have some type of supervision or some type of mutual accountability. I would suggest that you get together with other ministers every week for an hour or so and talk about the ministry you're doing and get honest feedback. Don't brag about how good you are. Talk about the problems you have and say, what would you do if you were in this situation? Now, I have committed myself about 15 years ago to such a weekly discipline, and it has revolutionized my ministry. When I got out of graduate school, for a while, I was, I was just so full of myself. I was doing everything I could do, and I didn't want to get in any type of supervision. And Wayne Oates came to me and said, Wade, I know you've been certified as a supervisor, and I know you're a diplomat in APC, and it says there you don't have to be in supervision anymore. But where are you getting help? And I rather boastfully said, well, from the Lord. The Holy Spirit guides me. He said, I've been there. He said, but let me invite you someplace. He said, Walter and Edward and myself meet on Thursday mornings at 7 o'clock, and we present our cases in rotation, and we get feedback from each other. And if it wouldn't hurt your feelings too much, we would like to invite you to start meeting with us because we're concerned about your Lone Ranger attitude. What a gift. What a gift. Those men had written more books than I had. They had more degrees and more certifications than I had. And they were willing to go to supervision and consultation. Why shouldn't I? Why? And it's been one of the greatest things that happened. I require it of every person, regardless of their level of certification, that works on the staff at our Christian Counseling Center. Go find yourself a peer group and be responsible to them. Seminary professors, get together with persons in your other in other disciplines and and regularly talk about what you're struggling with in your discipline and get feedback. I think one reason we get in difficulty is because we fail to make ourselves accountable to each other. It's it's there in the scriptures. The disciples were accountable to each other. Christ didn't go it alone. He got together a band of 12. And he cautioned them against ever, ever, ever going into private practice. There is no private practice ministry. We are all accountable ultimately to the church that ordains us. But we are accountable daily to each other. And that's especially true when you're working with teenagers. Especially when you're working with teenagers. We need to be under regular supervision and in regular consultation if we're going to be on the front lines. Can you imagine an army that would send each soldier out alone and not coordinate what they were doing? Why? Why would we let soldiers of Christ go out in such disarray? Ministering with families and teenagers... Like ministering to others in crisis means that we first begin by building hope. We survey the problem and the options with them, and we guide them toward a pathway of healing. And then we stay there for them. I would like to suggest a few ABC things we can do. Then I'll close. We need to build a contract for ministry. Once they know we care about them, then they can begin to believe that we expect to stay involved in helping them get there. We want to be involved in problem-solving discussions with them, where they say, my parents won't let me do that, my kids do this, and we say, okay, okay, let's look for solutions together. And we're there trying to help them find ways to bridge the gaps and find solutions. We encourage the parents to take some risk, and we encourage the teens to take a step back in their push for independence. 
an image I use with the parents and the teenagers is if you pull at each other, you are going to break those apron strings. Why not take one step toward each other and untie them appropriately? You don't have to tear the family apart, rip them apart. You can untie the apron strings. Provide the care for the parents and the care for the adolescent that's going to be necessary to take that reconciling step toward each other. Providing care means you're going to have to have a variety of ministries with them. You're going to have to respond in different ways. You're going to have to stay involved. But remember, your unique ultimate contribution is to their spiritual journey and to deal with their religious questions in an upfront, intellectual kind of way. You may have to clarify boundaries. You may have to clarify expectations. You may have to say to a family, sit down and write out the rules in this family and say to the teenager, contract that you're going to live by this and you're going to do that. Make it a regular matter of conversation for them. Any kind of counseling approach that you do with teenagers, I think, must involve their parents and their family and maybe their grandparents. If you can't get the family involved, you're going to have to find some mentor or some caring adult to be there for them. And don't forget to pray with them. Don't forget to tell them good Bible stories and equip them. Avoid magic. Embrace the faith. Remain open to their doubts as an area for growth. All families are not drawn into a crisis during adolescence, but those that are deserve the best that the church has to offer. We nurture healthy families when we create a holding environment for teenagers to grow up naturally, and then when we become a sanctuary for adolescents who are striving toward adulthood but have stumbled along the pathway. Let's have a question time. Teenagers have just gone through what PIJ calls a period of formal operations. They are they no longer think in just black and white. They see the gray. They can do algebra, they can do geometry, they can do calculus. You know, a couple of 18-year-olds are in some garage right now inventing a new way to do computers. Look at what Bill Gates did as a teenager with Apple. Their minds are up there, and when we're talking to them about faith, they're not going to listen to us in a way that doesn't take their question seriously. I guess the analogy...